Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to episode 36 of my vlog. And I haven't posted one for a few days because posting one every night was becoming, I won't say a bit of a chore because really how much effort is it to flip over the camera, hit record and just say some things <laughs> and and upload it so it's it it's not that it was a insurmountable task or you know, anything like that but it definitely as I'm as I've got a fair amount of things going on there was times where it just seemed like I kind of ran out of time in a bit especially evenings where I'm you know work working all day you know do jujitsu in the evening it, maybe I left straight from work do jujitsu in the evening and then head home you know, I had plenty of time for, again, some of these other kind of little social media efforts that I'm doing, especially um, TikTok, for instance, which has a little bit of that organic organic reach. And so there's maybe a little bit more instant grat immediate gratification, a little bit more feedback, uh, uh, casting a wider net. You know, I've, there's been a handful of videos now that I'm able to post something and get a bunch of feedback and connect with new people and get um, whether it's interesting uh, debates, you know, people bringing kind of counterpoints to the different wild and wacky ideas that I'm throwing out there. And then there's as, as well as the people who are supporting. And so that's kind of nice too for to just recognize, hey, there's like-minded people out there. And, and I think it's especially... Uh, Especially, hmm, <laughs> reassuring, given the area that I live in, which is, you know, kind of the greater Seattle area, which it, it seems like people really generally lean one way or, um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess I don't need to, you know, sugarcoat it too much, right? It seems like. Uh, most people in Seattle across the board lean one way and and that's just only become a real issue in the last year and a half so it's nice to again as to be putting ideas out there and go okay yeah we're just in the little bubble here but there's people all over that do not think that way you know in in basic stuff right I don't think everyone should be you know single-minded and uh, you can only relate to people who have your exact same political beliefs, but just some of the real basic fundamental stuff, which I think the big debate over the last year, it seems like the big dividing line that people fall on either side of is just this really basic idea of, you know, how much you should be able to impose your will and dictate your beliefs on other people's lives. And that's that's the, the to me the, the the baffling part. And I get it. I get that it's been hyped up. I get that um, you know the media gets people in a frenzy, um, and and people you know trust in these institutions, whether it's the the government or uh, the media. Um, you know, there's and that's that seems to be kind of a big di di dividing factor as well, right? Is this amount of trust or for the or for the esteemed organizations, right? That's one I get, I see a lot of, right? Is this, well, the CDC says, or the, you know, the, this esteemed, you know, doctor, or X, you know, listen to the experts, or X, Y, and Z. And, and yeah, so that seems to be a big dividing line. You have people who fall on one side who say, yeah, I don't, you know, sure, I'm, 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 I respect the, you know, expertise and the opinions of, of different people and organizations, but I'm not going to buy it wholesale and let that, you know, completely dictate my life one way or the other. And then you have people that are just, again, a lot more willing to lean on that and say, hey, well, you know, you don't have a PhD in this or that, so... Therefore, I'll I'll trust the science. I'll trust this and that. 
So that's been a big dividing factor. And then, and then turning that corner too and going, allowing uh, or encouraging the idea of being able to impose your will or, or beliefs on other people. Uh, because again, there, there's a, there is a happy solution that fits all. And, and I've said this before, which is the, and you already started to see it. If you leave people up to their own devices and they're aware of um, the risk factors that are out there in the world, uh, people will make decisions that are in their best interest, right? And that's, that is, that, that's just a plain fact, right? People will make decisions that are in their best interest. And so what you started to see in this area before government rules started to come down, X, Y, and Z, you know, this novel thing comes out, this health concern is, hits the streets, it becomes kind of a concern. And what did you see? You saw everybody making accommodations you know, even in our small business, our team kind of looking at it from every way, which different angle, regardless of your, you know, personal or political beliefs, we had people who were going, you know, hey, we're going to clean down and wipe down our surfaces. We're going to stagger our start time so that guys aren't interacting with each other. These are the creative things that people do when it's in their best interest. You know, and again, I'm thinking of two members on our team that, you know, very fundamentally different ends of the political belief spectrum xyz whatever you want to call it working together going hey can i go buy cleaning supplies can i buy disposable masks for the office and and so 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 there's this cooperation there's a collaboration because obviously you know no especially when this thing is so new nobody wants to Nobody wants to put our team at risk. Nobody wants to, um, yeah, put anyone's health in jeopardy, all of those things, right? But but we also, we have to make a judgment. We have to weigh in the balance this idea of, you know, taking into consideration this health concern, but then taking into the consideration our ability to earn a living and feed ourselves and our families, as well as provide the service that we provide to our customers that they want us there to do, right? Um, and 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 because on that end, you know, if the, if there's a demand there, it's only because of voluntary or a customer is voluntarily engaging in that demand, and that's why to me the most um, and I may have mentioned this on here before to me one of the most unfortunate frameworks that came about in this last year was this idea of essential versus non-essential uh, businesses or workers or employees because at the end of the day, and you go with the, there's a couple industries that got hit the hardest, right? And that's, you know, the restaurant industry, which I have, you know, a ton of sympathy for them I, to, to a degree. I mean, I think, what I would have loved to have seen is a lot more people go, a lot more restaurant owners and managers and teams go, hey, you know what, the, you know, go ahead and find us because we're, we got to stay open to uh, pay our staff and, and we have customers who are willing to come or, you know, do, or do it in secret. Like I would highly encourage and, and, um, would be curious to know if any of this did happen. You know, any the, were there any speakeasy restaurants that uh, were out there serving people? Because I know that there was definitely speakeasy jujitsu that was happening. It was deemed um, non-essential and it was deemed dangerous. And jujitsu gyms were closed. And I know for a fact, and I participated in the act of of training uh, jujitsu, blacking out the windows and doing it anyways. So however, you know, whether you're going to be public about it and make a stand, I think if you were going to do that, um, one thing that kind of I consider in that realm is, is memories I have of these certain big kind of constitutional cases, right? Those ones um, that we learn about in grade school growing up and um, that make it all the way up to the Supreme Court, 
and have a have a big impact on the law and you know whether it's how it's interpreted or it's kind of these big decisions and what I have this memory of, of learning I don't know it super well so if I'm off base by all means please let me know but it was this idea that a lot of these um, cases were started there there was a there was an intentional effort and a supported effort to test or clarify the law or push it in one direction or the other it was kind of a it was sort of political activism you know disguised as a legal case um you know whether it's a, a lawsuit or, or or things like that right or or even certain political activism right it's not in some cases this kind of just spontaneous thing that just sort of happens and then goes viral and catches a thing um and catches notoriety which that you know that may happen more and more today with the internet and social media and th you know but you know let's talk about like you know jim crow laws or the um uh, the south in the uh, early 20th century right when you had sit-ins on diners and um you know you had rosa park sitting sitting down on the bus my understanding and, and this is where i come into a, a wild guess because i actually don't know that much about rosa parks but my assumption would be that that was a kind of political activist thing that she that it, and i don't even know so okay, let me maybe pose it as a question and and get, get some clarity on this because my guess would be if i had to guess would be that it wasn't just that you know rosa parks was just on her way to work and just decided you know what, I'm not playing this game today, which it actually may have been that, <laughs> but uh, an alternative universe, yeah, it may have been that, hey, she was in, involved in the movement and that it was a supported thing and that, um, you know, it was a known, all right, guys, hey, you know, on this day, we're going to make this move and it'll be a media spectacle because it's just this little old lady. I actually don't know. Let me look it up. Cause so... Um, let's there's no need to um talk about things <clears throat> that i know nothing about we can just google it because um let's see okay so i'm gonna pull it up was rosa parks plan Okay, so did Rosa Parks plan to not give her seat? Okay, Parks, so here's just one Google, uh, history.com, 10 things you don't know about Rosa Parks. So this starts off and says, Parks did not refuse to leave her seat because her feet were tired. In her autobiography, Parks debunked the myth that she refused to vacate her seat because she was tired after a long day of work. Um, I was not tired physically, she wrote, or no more tired than it, uh, I usually was at the end of a working day. Let's see. Okay, so here we, let's go, we're going down the list. De ten, ten things <laughs> you may not know about Rosa Parks. This is a great rabbit hole. I'm, I'm glad we're on this guy. So... Um, Parks was not the first African-American woman to be arrested for refusing to yield her seat on a Montgomery bus. So nine months before Parks was jailed, 15-year-old Claudette Colvin was the first Montgomery bus passenger to be arrested for refusing to give up her seat for a white passenger. Parks was involved in raising defense funds for Colvin. Three other African-American women ba -ba -da -ba -da, also run afoul during... Uh, the, of the bus segregation law prior to parks there were four plaintiffs all right resulted in the supreme court ruling the bus segregation unconstitutional parks was a civil rights activist before her arrest so she was a longtime member of the double end naacp okay parks had a prior encounter with the bus driver who demanded she vacate her seat 
um, Blake had ejected Park from the bus after she refused to re-enter the vehicle through the back door, paying her fare at the front. I never wanted to be on that man's bus again. After that, I made a point of looking at who was driving before I didn't want any more run-ins with that mean one. Da -da -da -da. Okay, so here we go. After the written order from the Supreme Court outlawing bus segregation arrived, the Montgomery bus boycott ended on December 21st, 1951. Man, you know what this is pointing out? And I guess maybe this is boring for <laughs> people just watching me uh, read an article. But uh, it, moments like this that just, uh, it's almost embarrassing to me at how little U.S. history I know. And, and the, 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 the one thing I go back to, again, having kind of really doing some self-study over the last year is recognizing the socialized schooling system that we have and how detrimental it is to our actual development. And and th these are always just moments that point out where I'm like, man, I, I I've heard of some of these things, but I don't I don't know it so well. I haven't you know learned it to such a degree that it has this meaning that sticks um, because this is fascinating stuff, right? When you hear about when I hear the Montgomery bus boycott, okay, I'm piecing that together. I'm thinking, okay, I probably have heard some of these things, but you know, how, how deep do people really um, know this stuff, especially the younger generation, like my generation, where it, especially when we want to talk about, um, so many people are ready to speak on the, the, the way the system is structured today and nowadays when it's like, well, how how intelligently can you speak to how it once was and what the progress progress has been and how do we achieve that progress and what do these people at the time um, think? So, I guess yeah, it's moments like these that I go, that was a, um, that's just another example of these massive gaps in uh, my understanding of some some basic history stuff. So I'm excited to learn more. So here number four, okay. This answers the question that I did have, which it says her act of so civil disobedience was not premeditated. Although Parks knew that the NAACP was looking for a lead plaintiff in a case to test the constitutionality of the Jim Crow law, she did not set out to be arrested on bus 2857. Parks wrote in her autobiography that she was so preoccupied that day that she failed to notice that Blake was driving the bus. If I had been paying attention, I wouldn't even have gotten on that bus. Wow. Okay. So that that knocks out my theory out of the park, which was that maybe there was some premeditation in order to be a plaintiff in a case. So the fact that they're framing it in this way, I guess, makes the point that it's not um, that wouldn't be you know crazy out of the ordinary for at this these turning tides, the change in the law. Um, for people to want to again put in a, a piece, put in a person to do that, and I and to clarify, did not start down this road to act as if doing that would mean you have nefarious intentions or this, you know, it was not a value judgment. The point that I was trying to make. So let's just go back there before finishing this because I think it's super interesting. Um, the point that I was trying to make was for those fellow business owners out there in this last year and in this coming. Uh, period of time that um, we're heading into potentially, right? Because that's something I've been um, expecting or contemplating recently, which is, hey, if these lockdowns return, because they are in other countries, and I'm starting to hear murmurs and little social media that, hey, in late August, it's coming back. Um, so all of these things, my, the, the point that I was trying to make was if you're going to do it as an act of civil disobedience, it doesn't hurt to be prepared, right? And so to have a, a legal team or a legal resource or, you know, be, be ready to get get loud on social media. These, like, I, I, many of us, um, at least, you know, who've been keeping up, um, look to a guy like Ian Smith Fitness, right? A gym owner over in New Jersey, who he's he's been fighting tooth or nail for the state and with the state and again 
he that may ha not have been a premeditated like hey we're gonna get loud about this and throw it in the face like he probably would have been just as happy to hey we're just here doing our thing but at a certain point that's a tool you have to use to fight back and so the, the point that I'm getting to is I make no judgment between someone who wants to just continue doing business quietly um, and not attract any attention to themselves and those who decided to do it loudly and make a spectacle and, you know, uh, attract attention to the problem. So that, that was the only point I was trying to make um, was in, 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 I guess, posing the question as well that, um, you know, hey, how many of these big moments in our history that maybe turn the tide one direction or another are impromptu, which it seems like this one maybe is, but then there's, I'm, I'm sure there's examples of ones that were more premeditated, legal team in place, these types of things. So, yeah, that was, that was the only point I was trying to make, and I, I don't even know how we got there. So we'll keep, we'll keep cruising on this because um, this is, I'm finding this super interesting. So number five, uh, Parks was not sitting in a whites only section. So Parks was sitting in the front row of a middle section of the bus open to African-Americans if seats were vacant after the whites only section filled on subsequent stops and a white man was left standing. The driver demanded that Parks and three others in the row leave their seats while the others, the other three eventually moved Parks did not love that. Love that. Bold. Bold. You got you to gotta love it. And it's interesting. Okay, so there's these pictures of her. I wonder if those are a picture of her actually on the bus. Okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. Did not refuse to leave her seat because her feet were tired. Um, and that was the one I opened up with. So no more tired than I usually was at the end of a work day. I was not old, although some people have an image of me as being old then. I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. <clears throat> Love it. Love that rebellious spirit, man. That's what the American spirit's all about. Um, you know, a country of, of rebels, revolutionary uh, heritage. And... Yeah, I'm getting fired up just thinking about it. And it's interesting because I, <laughs> okay, I have connected these dots. And I, and I don't know if I got this from someone else. Like, it's very possible that I came across this analogy um, from someone else. And, um, <laughs> It, or if it was something I that I kind of came to on my own, I, I, I don't really think it matters. Um, so I guess I just I'm not trying to claim that I did, but I, but it's also something I've contemplated at certain times and definitely in the in the thick of it. And it's kind of a controversial thought or analogy. But in the in the heat of this last year and a half, in the heat of the the mask mandates and the social distancing and the this, this and that. I, it, with so much of it being divided along political and ideological lines and a lot of it not making sense either, right? Just not even making common sense, which there's so many classic examples of it, which is the, oh, you know, you're heading into, you know, restaurants open back up, but you're you know, you're heading in, but you have to wear a mask and then you can sit down and take it off and, but you're right next to people. It's just silly things. Oh, you know, you're, you're checking out at a register and you're this, you're this far from, you're this far from the cashier, but there's a plexiglass in between as if the air in the room isn't going to get around the plexiglass that's right there. So just, just silly things like that to where you could, I think, obviously I think you can make a case for that, that the rules were just absurd but the way in which they were enforced and the way in which people were treated who weren't abiding by those rules and again it being drawn along ideological lines the people that were not following the rules were treated with a tremendous amount of hostility 
And this was something I, um, I think I have, I mentioned in a previous video, which was like this idea of the loss of civility, right? Um, loved ones of mine being harassed for, you know, walking in the streets alone without a mask on, cursed out, um, you know, treated with a tremendous amount of hostility. And that's, uh, you know, female loved ones in my own life. In my personal experience, obviously being someone who is just more stubborn and more, you know, going to try and um, skate around it and break, quote unquote, break the rules as much as I can, you know, going into stores, um, Home Depot, just be, being as much of a, or just plainly, hey, I don't like wearing this mask. I think it's absurd. I think it's ineffective. I think it doesn't do anything. So I'm going to take every opportunity I possibly can to not wear it. And I will be perfectly honest too, that there was times where I caved and I was like, hey, you know, and there was also times where it's like, hey, we're going on a flight. Do we want to be at a flight risk? Do we want to get turned away? That some, I, you know, maybe Ian Smith Fitness might think I'm, a, I'm soft for that. Um, but there was times where I just did a quick cost benefit and I was like, you know what, it's best to get through this process to get to where I'm going and get back. Um, then, then, uh, then die on this hill. And, and there's times where to his credit, I've seen videos of him that he's posted of him going through the motions four hours at the, um, the airport, he's got his medical exemption, work in the motions. And honestly, it's like more pipe power to you, brother. Like I support that so much. And honestly, um, see him as a, as a trailblazer in that front and hope that he's able to, um, cr you know, break through and create a pathway for others. And Hey, whatever exemption he had, like, bro, send me that letter and tell, you know, post, uh, how you kind of arrange certain things and how are you getting, you know, cleared for the medical exemptions in advance, X, Y, and Z, bro, I am all, I'm all over that. I will, I will implement that in my own process. I've just been focusing on other things and, you know, didn't make the bandwidth to, um, to really double down on that specific aspect. But all that being said, the point that I was making is, hey, if I was, you know, and I'm just, I can go through countless examples in a corner store. And, and again, it was like, hey, an evening out and with the lady, you know what, I'll do the mask, no friction a lot. And that was a lot of times when I was with her, I'll, I'll play along uh, because it made her super uncomfortable, not with the actual act of it, but she's just not a confrontational person. She doesn't want to deal with any trouble. And she wants to get served, right? And in the area we're at, I mean, it, it, it is not a stretch of the imagination to think that if you would enter into any establishment without a mask on, you would get shouted down and you would get harassed and sent out of the store, which happened to me many times over. Or it's just around my nose and, hey, you need to put that up, da, 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 and I don't comply. And then it's just, oh, we'll call the cops. I mean, I, I, we did get the cops called on us at a Rite Aid. I'm, hey, I'm trying to buy a single battery. Oh, you got to do this and that. Okay, no, too late. You already broke the rules. You got to you gotta go. And so wrapping this all the way back, it was like in the heat of this, I had came to this analogy. <laughs> <laughs> and shared it with some of those kind of close people around me where I said, hey, the way we're being treated in many cases, and I'm not taking it to the extreme, and I'm not saying it's exactly the same or it's as bad or any of these things, but I was like, man, in many ways, or at least in the direction that this is heading, it's a, like people who don't ideologically align with these rules are being treated like blacks in the Jim Crow South. And so that may sound like an egregious analogy. So I tried to soften the blow and kind of set it up a little bit and throw some caveats out there because um, that is not to mean and, and diminish the idea of, hey, and at that time, and again, obviously I don't know much about the history, right? So um, the extreme that obviously didn't happen, right, is people were not being lynched in the streets here, um, beaten in the streets for these things. So 
um, by no means am I saying the you know the atrocities that likely transpired. Again, I'm not educated on it, so I I would um, need to you know, I, I need to dig into this and learn more about it. And I'm not so I'm not saying it's as extreme or as intense or universal um, because. Well, and I have another very interesting point on this one, which was I was talking to an older resident at a community that we work at recently because we work with a lot of, uh, we provide services for communities that have a lot of residents that are older or retired or things like that. And when I was talking with one of the residents and she said she had grown up in the South and she had recently just watched this movie and it was this movie of this black piano player. It's kind of a newer movie. Black piano player who has a white driver and they're driving through the South and they're running into, it's the Jim Crow South, they're running into all these scenarios. And she said for her, it was this very interesting observation. She said, I don't remember it being like that. I don't remember it being that bad or people being that hostile or this or that. And so complete ignorance i'm not i'm not making any sweeping statements but it would just be interesting if in some ways you know is there history that's being rewritten or is there propaganda to make certain situations seem like worse than they were like is it possible that a majority of people learn to live together they learn to coexist they learn to get along in some way shape or form there was maybe there was maybe what we would look back on as distasteful rules or this or that. And then you had the people on the fringes that, um, you know, were kind of more extreme and and held hate in their heart and treated people in a hateful way. But hey, was the majority just kind of, hey, I'm just going about my life, trying to raise a family, trying to earn a, a living. And I'm not walking around with, you know, hate in my heart and kicking dirt on other people's shoes every day. So all this is coming from a huge place of ignorance on the subject. It is something I do hope to uh, learn more about. But the point being that, hey, the way that if you weren't abiding by these rules, you were refused service, you were treated in a hostile manner, you know, you had the cops called on you, all these things. And so I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not this or that. It was just a very interesting, interesting year. So let's, let's get back into it. Because um okay so number seven weeks after her arrest parks was jailed a second time for her role in the boycott okay parks was on the executive board of directors of the group organizing the montgomery bus boycott and she worked for a short time as a dispatcher arranging car arranging carpool rides for boycotters on february 21st 1956, a grand jury handed down indictments against Parks and dozens of others for violating a state law against organized boycott. Huh? An organized law against or, uh, organized, excuse me, a state law against organized boycotting. That's wild. She and 114 others were arrested and the New York's Time ran a front page photograph of Parks being fingerprinted. Okay, so again, here another another case of she was very involved with this right she was very in the game um parks was forced to move from montgomery soon after the boycott okay so weeks after her arrest parks lost okay what does this say okay so this is all just 10 10 things you may not know so each one of these things that they're saying they're not saying it's a myth and then debunking it they're saying the real thing so Number eight, Parks was forced to move from Montgomery soon after the boycott. Okay, weeks after her arrest, Parks lost her department store job, although she was told by the personnel officer that it was not because of the boycott. Her husband quit his job after being told that there could be no discussion of the boycott or his wife in the workplace. Throughout the boycott and beyond, Parks received threatening phone calls and death threats. In 1957, she, along with her husband and mother, moved to Detroit, where she eventually worked as an administrative aide for Congressman John Conyers Jr. and lived the rest of her life. All right, interesting stuff. Number nine, Parks was the first woman to lie in honor at the U.S. Capitol. Was the first woman to lie in honor. 
after Parks died at age 92 on October, October 24th, 2005, she received a final tribute when her body was brought to the Rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. More than 30,000 people filed past her coffin to pay their respects. Number 10. Bus seats were left empty to honor Parks on the 50th anniversary of her arrest on December 1st, 2005. Transit authorities in New York City, Washington, D.C., and other American cities symbolically left the seats behind the bus driver empty to commemorate Parks' act of civil disobedience. So, inspirational stuff. Love it. Um, love the the revolutionary attitude the activist attitude um and it's this uh, all these topics are interesting kind of complex things right there's different angles one one question that i asked and maybe i'll save this one uh kind of as a full discussion or maybe not i don't know we'll, we'll keep it going here um but uh one question that i have been contemplating recently and this is very much from an economic perspective um, is this idea of the Civil War and hey what if what if Abraham Lincoln had allowed the South to secede and I'll tell you I'll tell you where this idea sparked from so uh, it was a Peter Schiff podcast I think it came out on July 4th right so this is I guess has been brewing for a while now um, but this Peter Schiff podcast on july 4th and he had talked about the history of slavery which um he framed it in a very interesting way in in the in the sense of he was trying to basically highlight the fact that there's there's this a somewhat rewriting of history and this this sort of America bashing which seems to be just like kind of the culturally appropriate thing to do nowadays and talk about the the disgrace of slavery and hey you know America didn't ban slavery till um, the uh, emancipation uh, emancipation proclamation and actually this may have been I don't think this was his Juneteenth episode, so I think it was a, the July 4th one, but some of it kind of carried over because he talked a fair amount about um, this idea in the Juneteenth episode. And the main point that he wanted to get across was, yeah, well, this, the United States as a whole didn't ban slavery um, for... And, and to me, it was always this really weird idea that um, about the Civil War because it seemed like, hey, the fact that it seemed like maybe slavery was obviously a key component to it, but maybe it just in some ways didn't seem like necessarily the driving factor because it wasn't like, um, you know, all slaves. There, there was like this... Um, you know, like the, that the banner that the North was fighting under from the start was this idea of freeing all the slaves, right? And so um, it's just very interesting to look back and, and contemplate. Um, and and bef before getting to that, so this Peter Schiff, this point that he was making was, hey, let's see um, uh, timeline of U.S. states abolishing slavery here we go um, man I wish it was like when did it open up so let's see We're in Wikipedia. So, you basically, like in the 1770s and 80s, a bunch of the New England states, I thought it was Vermont that was first, according to Peter Schiff. Um, 
but a lot of these states um, were banning slavery at that time, which was well before many other places in the world. And he, he also makes the case that, hey, the African slave trade, it wasn't the U.S. that started it. You know, they obviously participated in it. Um, and so all of those points kind of to, to the to the idea of hey there was this trend towards abolishing slavery slavery very early and very strong and, and lots of uh, states were doing it and he makes the point that at that time you know uh, the the states were much more independent in a sense um, than they are maybe today or he just equates it to hey it was a lot more like you know these these states in many cases had a lot more sovereignty and um, were kind of their, you know, there was a, a much more looser knitting than maybe once the Constitution was ratified and um, because when was that? Maybe in the 1780s or 90s? Maybe 1789? Um, so there was there was at least from the start a much more loose knitting, much strong even at the start of the union a much stronger um, states' rights, things like that. Um, to where, to, and so the point being that it was a lot, it was significant that a state would abolish it, would ban that practice within their own borders. Right, that was a significant act because they were more you know, kind of sovereign than maybe they are today and I'm, I'm getting obviously well out of my expertise as I often do um, so I may be missing some of the details but the point that I was coming to was you have this crossroads you have these states that are looking to secede and, the, and I think the reason that I think about it is I think about the you know political and ideological divide that does exist so strongly um, today and in, in, in so many different dimensions and it may not even just be a straight divide you know two sides it may be a, di a divide of kind of a fracturing you have sort of different factions and different parties and people kind of that all want different things and in this kind of the notion that I've gotten from Milton Friedman is that you you the most freedom you have possible means the most people are just gonna get exactly what they want and not have to conform to, and how does he put it? It was like, uh, you can get unanimity without conforming, something like that. I'm, I'm butchering that, I'll have to, I'll have to go back and, and look into what that, that saying was. But basically I, the idea that in a free market, again, everyone, can get what they want without having to conform. And so when I think about the history of the states, and I think about, hey, the current state that we're in, I go, man, at that time, when the South got together and, you know, they called their Congress, and I, I had read an interesting article um, that I then posted a TikTok on, and it was talking about, hey, the way that they did it was... And again, I'm out of my expertise. It's just my memory of one small article I read, but was the same way that they got into and ratified. You know, they called a Congress, they sent delegates, they all collectively made this decision. Hey, we went into this contract. Now we want out. You know? <laughs> and and basically, what the Lincoln administration said is, Hey, no, 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 no. This is blood in, blood out. Like you can't, you can't just back out of this agreement. Um, we need to save the union and we need to we need to keep together uh, under one banner and um, and and so the the kind of question being well could we have lived is it possible that we could have lived as good neighbors if you allow the south to secede could we have lived as good, friendly neighbors? And the thought that I had too was, because, it, or and I'm bouncing around a little bit here, but stick with me, is because I think the argument people would make is, hey, you know, the 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 fort, uh, the federal fort was captured and wherever it was, I think 
what is it, Fort Sumter or Sumner in Virginia, was captured, and then boom, Union forces got to go and take that back. Um, as the ball gets rolling, you people eventually make the justification, well, hey, it was a justified war because it ended slavery, right, would be the justification that I think people would make, but then the question being is, okay, how many lives were lost? And I th I'm throwing it out there. I think it was something like 600,000 people died during the Civil War. So it's like, how many lives were lost during that era? And was it worth the accelerated timeline, quote unquote, if, the, if you could even make that case, was it worth the timeline of ending slavery? Because to, to be, I guess, honest, you would have to entertain the other potential universe where um, where if the South secedes and the North goes, hey, you know what? It was, you know, do, do your thing. It was nice being associated with you. You obviously don't want that anymore. Carry on. We'll exist as good, friendly neighbors. And, um, you know, the North was, it wasn't even all free states at that time, I don't think. I'm not sure because <laughs> I grew up in a socialized school system, so I don't know um, a lot of this history. But so let's say the North is, hey, you got lots of freedom up there. And then in the South, you still have all, you know, a bunch of slave states. Well, then imagine what would happen, right? Would you have this great migration? Would you have that Underground Railroad, these people, um, all of all of the slaves trying to escape their, the trap that they're in and go north and get freedom and at that time you know again as a north you know as the union as the north country you might um, have a strong border and you might have a strong system saying hey we're not going to send your people back and we're going to def defend our sovereignty so don't come up here trying to snatch your uh, your people back and dra drag them back into slavery you we're, we let you secede we're cool um, you know, we're turning our, our, we're turning a blind eye to what we think is maybe, um, uh, abhorrent behavior, but don't come up here and try and, uh, bring these people back across the board. Not, not going to happen. So then at that point, maybe you have some tension, but you don't have a full blown civil war. And then the South at a certain point realizes, Hey, you know, our economy is going to collapse regardless if we don't adjust and figure out how to re-engineer our systems to be able to support the economic systems but without needing slavery and then you have a smoother transition out of it you have less lives lost in the civil war and then maybe today you have two thriving beautiful neighboring countries and this is obviously a bit of a, a bit you utopia speak right so i'm not um trying to be naive but I guess it was just more of that idea that, hey, if you just allow freedom to take hold, um, does it does it provide for a smoother transition into the modern civilization that we enjoy today? So we went a bit all over the place. It's late on a Sunday evening, you know, big work week coming up. We're, you know, with the start of August means that we are fully in the thick of it you know our business is uh, very seasonal and august should be a big month we're feeling it we've been feeling the the work picking up and things getting busier lots of more, lot a lot more days out in the field so um so it's going to be a big week we're going to be cranking away um and that uh and so that being said, again, I'm continuing to, I've got other things going on, but I'm continuing to uh, try and do this kind of social media effort or content effort because, because of the same reasons that I've been throwing out there or threw out there initially. Um, but I'm thinking for the YouTube channel specifically, I might dial back the volume to a small degree, um, you know, not in this very moment, need to you know capture a 20 30 you know 5 10 15 20 minute 30 minute video every single day 
but at a minimum, I think I, what I'll shoot for is at least once a week. So, I mean, at least, you know, it just so happened to do it on a Sunday. So maybe at least on a Sunday, I'm, I'm uh, catching kind of a longer form video and then throughout the week trying to do the, the TikToks and then, you know, I don't know, maybe if it makes sense to do, if I have uh, some I'm really wanting to capture, I'll do more um, in a week. And then if I don't, um, then then I won't. And, and, I'm, and I guess what I'm maybe hoping too is that there will be a little bit more quality just by just by dialing it back a little bit if I'm doing once a week maybe I have time um, during the week to go okay cool on Sunday I really you know I want to do an episode on Rosa Parks or I want to do this so that so I can spend the week kind of studying collecting some notes da 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 you know putting them in my little journey uh, composition book um, and then and then can actually deliver a more interesting episode so maybe maybe in this realm maybe start to lean a little bit more towards um, quality over quantity because i think that there's maybe other avenues that are great for quantity um, so that's just my thoughts i may change and switch it up whenever i feel like it so <laughs> that being said i what i think i'm pretty sure i've seen the community the tribe has grown to something like seven i want to say which to me is super exciting that people are uh, checking in, checking it out. I think a couple of those are probably both uh, family members. So, of course, thank you guys. Um, and so somewhere in there, though, one or two more people have jumped in and subscribed. So I appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think of the episode in the comments. Anything else, the same uh, spiel as always. Let me know if there's any topics you want. Um, to kick around and so then again maybe if I get some topic requests I can spend the week kind of gathering some notes and then at the very latest next Sunday hit an episode so with that appreciate all of you guys and 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 as usual hope you, hope you're having a productive summer and and enjoying yourself and staying you know grateful and content with all the beautiful things in our lives and and with that have a great evening and have a good week, and I'll see you guys next time. Later.